We need a new spiritual milieu. We need a new spiritual way of understanding the nature of what it is to be a human being. Because the old ways, the old mythologies, the old monarchy, king, god, versus the old lawful scientist way of doing everything are dead. They need to be buried. While religion does not have any foundation in reality other than the odd coincidence found in their texts and some intuitively based guidelines to life and living, the scientific method has given people like this the kind of lifestyle that makes it possible for them to badmouth the very thing that has kept this man alive far longer than he would have survived without it. Further, religion will continue to exist for as long as people accept and follow such beliefs. The scientific method will continue to exist as long as there are new discoveries to be made, which is to say that the likelihood of us ever finding science obsolete is such that it is practically impossible. Far from being dead, science is still very relevant, especially in today's world. We need a new realm, a new vision, and I think quantum physics, if anything, could help us get a step up in the right direction. And so begins the real meat of this production, the hijacking of the scientific principles of quantum physics. Let's see what follows, shall we? I think the key aspect of the new paradigm, at least in medicine, which is my little piece. Who is Candice Pert? A doctorate and postdoctorate of pharmacology, educated at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, has published over 250 scientific articles on peptides and their receptors and their role in the immune system, seems to portray the idea that her medical background, or her little piece, as she refers to it, gives her the authority to speculate on unrelated scientific and spiritual subjects, and as per most of the guests on this production, also does not have the relevant scientific background necessary to propose that quantum theory can affect the macroscopic world in the ways that she proposes. Um, is that consciousness is real and has an impact. This is hardly a startling revelation. Consciousness is real. It is a function of brain activity, one for which we have had evidence for some time in both biology and medicine. When brain damage occurs, the result is an impairment in the victim's cognitive and thought abilities. Brain death is unrecoverable. That's how real consciousness is. However, it is not divorced from physical matter, as this production claims, as we will see over the course of the videos I will analyse. We have to go beyond our senses to create a new paradigm. In other words, welcome to Pretendland. Who is Joseph Dispenza? Studied biochemistry at Rutgers University in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Also has a Doctor of Chiropractic degree from Life University. Is a member of the International Chiropractic Honor Society. Has released a DVD series, Your Immortal Brain, which quote, looks at ways in which the human brain can be used to create reality through the mastery of thought. End quote. Does not hold any qualifications relevant to the field of quantum mechanics. It may very well be that what's going on inside of you, in your brain, in your nervous system, in your nature of observation, how memory works, how mind works, it may very well be that what is happening there is some kind of observer matter interrelationship. In other words, an interaction between electrical signals in your brain, the transmission and receipt of those signals between your brain and your body, and a connection between the senses your body utilizes in interpreting what is going on in the exterior environment that we know of as reality. Which is indeed making things real for you, affecting how you perceive reality. How people perceive reality has no effect on the reality of the universe itself. To make a statement that assumes a position that one's perception of reality somehow has an effect on the reality itself is to invoke a logical fallacy. It certainly does not count as evidential support for their ideas. It's not changing the reality out there. It, you, you know, you're not changing big chairs and big trucks and bulldozers and rockets taking off. You're not changing those, no. But you're changing how you perceive things and maybe how you think about the things, how you feel about things, how you sense the world. This may be the most sensible and correct suggestion that this man has made thus far in the movie. However, just because he is referring to changing one's perception of reality doesn't mean that there is any credence to spiritualist claims, nor does it excuse his comments against the scientific method that he presented earlier in this movie. Further, it begs the question, if, as Mr. Wolf suggests, the change that is happening is in an individual's perception of reality as opposed to the nature of reality itself, then exactly what practical use does this have either to the individual or to society as a whole other than as a placebo? That's what's important here. The infinite information that the brain is processing every single second tells us that there's more to the world than we're perceiving. 
Exactly what additional information is Mr. Dispenza referring to? Telepathy? Telekinesis? Teleportation? While it is perfectly reasonable to assume that there is a lot more information processing and exchange happening than we are conscious of, it doesn't follow that any of this extraneous information is of a supernatural or spiritual origin. However, every single time we're immersed in an experience with our senses, seeing, smelling, tasting, feeling, as we're immersed centrally in our reality. I'd like to know what his point is here. We know nothing about reality. We have spent the last several tens of thousands of years examining our reality and at least several centuries quantifying and measuring this reality. We have made testable and accurate predictions about the observational reality around us and I am not about to sit here and let a comment like this slip by without severe rebuke against the filmmakers for such a disrespectful ignorance of the hard work that many generations before us have undertaken in getting us to our current level of understanding in today's world. All of our sense of so-called reality out there is filtered through our sense organs. Yes, our sensory organs connect us to the exterior reality we live in. Just because some people's perception of reality doesn't necessarily measure up to the standard doesn't mean that you can throw the standard out entirely. It is certainly no excuse to say, we know nothing of reality. Just because someone might be taking drugs or undergoing meditation and as a consequence seeing things that they have no explanation for doesn't mean the explanation isn't forthcoming. To say we know nothing about reality is fallacious at best and sickeningly dishonest at worst. Conducting experiments to quantify and measure the reality we live in has allowed us to set up a baseline of understanding that we have been able to accurately gauge and test in reality throughout every scientific field of understanding that we have so far sought understanding of. We don't know everything, but what we do know does not amount to nothing. The brain processes 400 billion bits of information a second, but we're only aware of 2,000 of those. At last, some figures I can examine. The problem with this argument is that, in the first instance, it relies upon a mathematical claim that cannot easily be verified. How many bits is processed by the brain is difficult to quantify in any meaningful fashion, simply as the brain is not a binary processing organism. There is no on-off when a neuron is fired in the brain, nor is there a measure of clock speed, so such figures are meaningless at best. However, we consciously recognise a lot more information than this guest gives us credit for. 2000 bits, or 2 kilobits or 256 bytes, or a fraction of a second of a compressed mp3 track is practically useless when you are referring to the amount of auditory, visual, tactile, olfactory and motor neuron information that the body relies upon. A mechanical robot device with all of these functions would never function at a throughput of less than a kilobyte of information per second. That means that reality is happening in the brain all the time. That is as absurd as someone saying, we process $250 a minute through our checking accounts at Funny State Bank, but each of us might only be aware of 10 cents of that throughput, and that's why we know the grass is blue rather than green. The two statements do not logically follow. We are skipping the scene that follows. It appears to be a conversation taking place between a woman in an apartment and the photographer who we have so far had glimpses of throughout this section of the movie. It might have entertainment value and might even make some spiritual point, but the points being made are also made by the guests on screen later anyway, so I will wait until then to address it. And the eyes are, uh, in some senses, a camcorder because they are taking that information and they're, they're storing it, but, but they're not, you're not really able to get it to mean anything until you actually put it all together. So in some senses it requires the editor's table to really put the whole thing together, to put the movie together of what your, your life and your world is actually about. Who is Andrew B. Newberg, assistant professor of radiology at the University of Pennsylvania Hospital, a physician in nuclear medicine, co-author of the book Why God Won't Go Away, Brain Science and Biology of Belief, has argued that the integration of science and religion is a critical matter for the better understanding of how human beings think and behave in a global context. Quite. Trained in medical sciences as opposed to physical sciences, Dr. Newberg is not in a position to make predictions and speculations on how quantum mechanics works in the macroscopic world. Dr. Newberg, while not technically correct, does make a case in layman's terms for the processing that we do on our brains such that we can interpret what we see. However, this is possibly accepting the movie editing analogy at the end. We are still living in a real-time existence, and as such, there is no such thing as movie editing in our consciousness. If I get out of bed in the morning, okay, 
and I suddenly decide um, to take very seriously the claim, which is surely a true claim, that I don't know for sure if my eyes are working correctly, okay? Um, so that for all I know, even though it looks like there's a stable floor by the side of my bed, there might be a cliff or something like that, okay? Um, if I am unable to order those possibilities in terms of probabilities that I assign to them, then I'm not going to get out of bed. It seems to me I'm paralyzed in the most literal sense of the word, okay? I'm not... Um, um, I'm going to have no idea how to literally take the next step. It's definitely the case that we know that my eyes might in principle be deceiving me at any moment. We've had experience of people before, subject to hallucinations, and even if we didn't, we don't know how to prove as a fundamental matter that our eyes never deceive us. That's absolutely right. While it is possible for our eyes to deceive us in a metaphorical sense, this is not the same thing as not being able to trust your senses. Whatever impression the filmmakers are trying to portray here, Dr. Albert's statements, possibly taken out of context, do not agree with their ideas. As I said previously, there is a baseline from which we can measure. For example, while people hold the misconception that the colour violet can appear to be different to the individual depending on their perception of reality, the reality itself is that the colour violet occupies a portion of the electromagnetic spectrum between indigo and UV light, and this can be measured using scientific instruments whereupon a consensus can be reached. It is possible to verify the observational reality that is presented by the human sensory interface, you know. But when we make the decision to get out of bed in the morning, we are assigning probabilities to the various hypotheses compatible with my seeing a floor by the bed. One hypothesis is there really is a floor there, and that's why I'm seeing it. Another hypothesis is my seeing the floor is a hallucination, and there's a cliff there. If after you've lived in a place for any appreciable length of time whereupon you've had the experience of seeing a floor next to your bed you wake up and suddenly see a cliff there instead, you have some very serious perceptual issues and would be well advised to seek the assistance of an experienced medical practitioner at the earliest opportunity. If on the other hand, as suggested here, your perception tells you that there is a floor there when in fact there is a cliff, then having woken up in exactly the same situation for some time and having gotten out of bed several times in the past, Shouldn't you have fallen off the cliff that you thought was a floor? At some point, the speculation needs to stop, and you have to accept the observational evidence for the reality that everyone by definition experiences. By getting out of bed in the morning, you endorse one of those hypotheses as more likely than another. Whether you, as an individual, endorse one or the other of these ideas as valid over the other is not a reflection on whether one is correct and the other incorrect. Reality is not dictated by personal opinion or belief, which is precisely why there is testing, repeatability and accuracy of predictions in modern scientific investigation. It is precisely to avoid the kinds of nonsense that this production is proposing. Well, ultimate reality, I think it very frequently depends a lot on how a person perceives it and, uh, and what they actually think is, is the real reality of our world. If that were true then we would not get consistent results when testing presuppositions to destruction in the scientific arena. What Dr. Newberg is asserting is the idea that reality is what one person makes of it, and while it is true that you as an individual can make conscious choices that affect your life, it is not the same thing as being able to bend reality to your will or on a whim. It always amuses me when pseudo-scientific nonsense is presented in the form of a guy wearing a lab coat, as if that gives it any credibility. The brain is processing 400 billion bits of information and our awareness is only on 2,000. This is a repeat assertion and it is still incorrect. That means reality is happening in the brain all the time, it's receiving that information, and yet we haven't integrated it. This production has so far been light on providing evidence for any of the claims thus presented. It doesn't even provide proper citations and sources, so on what basis is Mr. Dispenza making this claim? I'd really like to know, since he is not a specialist in organic neuroprocessing systems.